Now I'd like to bring up Wendy Pose, our next speaker. Um, she has designed and developed taxonomy and search applications for large organizations for over 20 years. She served on development teams for Lotus's uh, Notes, Domino, and Discovery server products and managed search and taxonomy integration for IBM's corporate intranet. And she's currently the CTO of InfoClear Consulting. So here to take us into the world of big data, please welcome Wendy Pose. Thanks, Stuart, and hi, everybody. And I have to start by saying, luckily for me, one of the activities that makes me happy is working, because this talk is going to be a lot drier <laughs> than the great talk that Laura just gave you. But we'll get started anyway. Um, I'm going to be talking about taming big data with ontology. So first, I want to tell you actually a little bit about me, because it is germane to some of this great stuff that Laura was saying, because I've been around for a while, and I sort of came up like probably some of you did as a librarian. And one of the things that we used to feel happy about in the 20th century <laughs> was that computers and librarianship and the internet, when it, in its early, early, early days, enabled people to connect. And quite honestly, that's why I'm in this biz and that's what makes me happy. So we're all in the right place. Now back to the dry stuff. Okay, first some definitions. Um, I'm going to talk about, you'll hear a lot about big data. And now I'm going to go into the back room, essentially. I'm going to go into the systems room in the back office. And when I think about big data, I think about techniques that help us manage data sets that are too large and complex to manipulate or interrogate with standard methods or tools. Now again, when you think about this, I, I love Laura's talk so much that I want to keep harking back to it in terms of the interconnectedness of now, in terms of the fact that we've got so many new techniques that enable us to access lots and lots of data, that's what big data is talking about. It's just more of the same. It's more of what we've always done. Um, some of the examples, though, the other thing that's going on now is that um, when we talk about big data, there's a kind of formalism to it. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about ontologies. But you'll hear examples of techniques that access a lot of different kinds of data, like IBM's Watson. And you guys might have heard of Watson because he won Jeopardy. And I call him he, but really Watson, because it's a big data application, is lots and lots of things, including ontologies, including software that knows how to get the phrases out of text, including things that make categories, which is what we all do. Graph databases. We have a graph database expert in the, in the audience here what graph databases do as a technique to access big data is allow you to get to all these connections as part of your interconnectedness really, 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 really fast. And again, those of us who are old school remember relational databases and all sorts of other methods that were kind of slow and kind of clunky and you kind of had to know the language of the system you were using to access the data. Graph databases help us get around all of that. And again, that's why to me they're a big data technique. Search engines, goes without saying, our friend Google and everybody else, accesses lots and lots and lots of data, and that's big data technique. And content analytics, and what I mean by that, again, is software that doesn't know how to read so very much, but knows how to understand how to parse text, right? So it can do a really good job of taking proper names or entities, people, places, and things, and I'll talk more about that out of text. So there are all these things, right? There's all this old school data processing with lots and lots of information and these techniques that help you do a little bit better with it, get to know a little bit more about it. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, we have ontologies. And how many of you guys know what an, what an ontology is or have used one? OK, that's pretty good because <laughs> sometimes they make me nervous. So I'm going to give you my definition, right? It's a grown-up taxonomy or a grown-up thesaurus but it lets us aggregate a lot, a lot of information from a lot of different places and make connections that allow us or systems to infer meaning, and I'm doing my air quotes, from all of this data. Now again, I'm gonna talk a lot about art versus science in our business during my talk, and ontologies today, there's a lot, again, a lot of formalism. And when people talk to you about an ontology, they're going to talk to you about standard formats. They're going to talk to you about SCOS, which is a format for taxonomies and a format for ontologies. They're going to talk to you about RDF, which is a way to organize the data so that systems can get to it easily. You're going to hear all of that. But to me, the ontology is what 
sort of the word it comes from, it's the definition of a domain of knowledge that allows you to understand all the connections and how they fit together and how you can use them sort of in your life. Um, the other good news about ontologies is that they use relationships that are standard. You know, you can say something, um, a dog is an animal, and everybody sort of knows what that is. Systems can understand what that is. You can say um, that a baby is a child of a parent, and you can get a lot more fancy, and I'll show you some of the examples of being more fancy. Um, good news again about the 21st century is that ontologies can be crowdsourced. So we don't have to have this really formal, give me a headache list of relationships and standards. You can tell me the kind of relationships that mean a lot to you that I should include in my ontology. And some examples of that, DBpedia, you know, Freebase, you guys probably heard of, even though I guess Google just bought them, right? Um, my point here is since all this IT investment is going towards these big data techniques, and you know if it's jargon, people are going to put money on it, particularly marketing people. We also need the ontology at the back end so we can make some of these techniques mean something to us. And again, going back to Laura, make us happy. So why do we really do it? Yeah. Um, I actually been using this, Rutherford D. Rutherford D. Rogers was a librarian at Yale, and he said this quote, I think in 85, 86, that we're drowning in information and starving for knowledge. Big data, anyone? I mean, that's what it sort of feels like. And then again, this is my favorite cover that I've ever seen in my life, because sometimes when I first saw it, I thought it was a librarian against the invisible stranger, and I was like, oh, that's kind of awesome. But the librarian against the invisible strangler is even better because it's all oh, this big data. It's just sort of choking us. So hopefully, we librarians in the crowd are gonna be good at taming this guy. We don't have to murder big data, but we'll tame it. <laughs> so what is an ontology, okay? And again, I know you guys are all in the biz, so forgive me for preaching a little bit to the choir. But at the very basic, it's a list. And I'm doing some of these ontologies, I'm gonna talk about this later, in a couple of real life situations. And we really do always start with lists of allowed values, just like the old days. You know, lists of drop downs from, you know, very static drop downs from a menu when you're gonna buy something. So uh, that's the simplest. Taxonomy, we all kind of know. It's hierarchy, or do we all know it? Do you guys, you guys do taxonomy in your real lives? Yeah, okay, so it's hierarchy. Um, Sometimes, when I first did this chart, I wanted thesaurus to be less complex than taxonomy. But as the world has evolved, it turns out that taxonomies have this very formal hierarchical definition. And we gorped it a lot in IT because we call everything a taxonomy. Everything, you know. Really, it's got this kind of formal definition. Thesaurus, again, if you came up through library school, you know what that is. We have relationship types, RTs. We have use force. We have synonyms. We have all sorts of cool stuff. And again, the point here as we get on this complexity spectrum is that the relationships are part of the data. The relationships are helping us understand the data. It's not just flat lists of things. And then finally, we have the ontology, and again, formalism alert. You have classes, which are categories or types of things. Instances, you know, animals, a dog is an instance of an animal. Um, relationships between these things, and they don't have to be as formal as we used to be, which is very nice. You can sort of use one of these programming or modeling languages to create a relationship between two things and give it a name that means something, and I'll show you some of that too. Um, let's see, properties associated with these things. Again, if you're in the real world and use taxonomy, we put property on taxonomies all the time, but they're more formal in the ontology world. Um, functions, things do things. Things in my taxonomy do things. We use verbs now. Verbs are awesome to me <laughs> in taxonomies. Until we never used to use them. It was noun phrase heaven when I was coming up, and now we can use verbs. Um, and also constraints, which helps us with meaning. If something can't, you know, if you can say, if you can use not, not is awesome in your taxonomy. And I can think of a couple of examples where you want to disambiguate, you know. I'm just trying to think of something off the top of my head, but something what, sometimes what something isn't tells you a whole lot about what it is. I don't mean to be so cryptic. So what do ontologies look like? So I don't know, have you guys heard of Yago? Have you ever used Yago? Yago is from the Max Planck, <laughs> I like to say it like that. 
Institute, and I'm giving a nod to my son-in-law, who's a physicist, when I say that today. But, and it's a general purpose ontology, available on the web, and I can show you where later, um, mostly dealing with people, places, and things, or entities. And just to give you a sense of it, I looked up Dave Grohl, because I have a crush on him, and <laughs> you can see that, <laughs> and I'm a little squinty here, you can see who links out to him, if you can see this slide. And you can see that Bruce Springsteen does, and Nine Inch Nails, and some of the sound gardens, some of the things I'm surprised don't link to him. And then their, their attributes, attributes like when he was born, and influences, which is a relationship between him and somebody else that somebody has given a name to because it's meaningful in the context of a musician. And you can see that some of these things also, to talk about the formalism again, have very specific programming looking names. Okay, was born on date was clearly an attribute that somebody could give it a name that made sense. But if you look, well, has one prize is a good one too. But RDF colon type, <laughs> that's because they're using RDF, which is a standard output format, and they're using a standard convention for an ontology called type. And they're grabbing categories, which are what they mean when they talk about types, from Wiki. And you can see from Wikipedia, you can see there's a whole lot of kind of cool categories. So this is what an ontology can look like, right? Another one that's a lot more fun, even though I love Dave, is a visualization. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is kind of awesome. <laughs> the 11th Doctor. <laughs> I, lo <laughs> I love Capaldi, but Matt Smith rules. Okay, but what the interesting thing here, and the, the thing I want to point out here, okay, so we've got the Doctor in the middle, and we've got a lot of relationships with names that aren't just standard and mean a lot in the context of Doctor Who's world, right? So we have Amy and Rory. They're both companions. They love each other, so there's a verb, love. We've got the enemies, and that points, it's a relationship that points to people. We've got appeared in, which is like the prizes that Dave Grohl won. You can see where he appeared. And we've got some more mean enemies here. Stole, it's another great verb. You know, and so I have a database, I have an ontology of criminals, so I need a stole relationship type. But again, it's just linking things to another, connectedness, the theme, and giving them names. So how do they work? in the world of big data. I think I've sort of said this before, but they, they're sitting right there in the middle of the pyramid. And if you think about it, this is more, this is more again, um, sort of behind, you know, behind the firewall kind of way of looking at it, because all the structured content, which is the content maybe you create on some public-facing website, plus all these you know, archives of big data, anything really you want to think about, all the stuff that goes into a search engine, is managed by these big data techniques, again, the software that runs against them and does something to them, and are made sense of by using the ontology. And I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna try to bring this down to earth a little bit by talking about a couple of them that I built in corporate environments, but the thing that matters to us as info architects, we're over here, we create and maintain the ontology, and sometimes it's we, one of us, and sometimes it's we, many of us, and sometimes it takes a village. And we also create rules to understand how we decide, for example, this is a gimme, but if, how we decide that Daleks are enemies of the doctor. But maybe there's somebody who's a little bit more ambiguous, and we have to make those decisions, either as humans or as by building software that helps us make those decisions. The other thing some of us have is subject area expertise, and that helps us kind of write this, these rules. So if you ever get, you know, if somebody says, oh, I need an ontologist, they need an ontologist. If you've done a thesaurus or if you've done a taxonomy, and if you're comfortable in the formalism of XML, RDF, SCOS, any of those, you can do ontology. It's just grown up thesauri. Okay, so some real life examples. Um, most of what I've done with this stuff has been customer support apps because people are mining social data, like tweets, and like customer support logs, to understand both sentiment analysis, or what people are saying is good and bad, and brand loyalty. So why you need an ontology for that is, for example, if I'm in a customer support role, I want my ontology to know about, to include the kind of user issues that I talk about or my customer support people talk about when they write their support logs. 
So if I'm, you know, a hospital, if I'm a hotel, I care a lot about cleanliness, and I would have that in my ontology. I care a lot about, if I'm the manager of the hotel, I care a lot about being paid. So payment would be in my ontology. So that's the kind of things you do to build the ontology. There are actions that um, I would take in the context, for example, of being in the hospitality business. I might give refunds, and that's an action. I show that as one of those links. I might have to change reservations, and that's an action that I show in one of those links. So ontologies for specific purposes, you think about sort of like that. Um, again, you know, I was trying to think of making life better when I was first putting this talk together. And uh, things like aggregating a power grid and summarizing a power grid and so that we know when events happen were something that made a lot of sense to me. I'm going to talk very quickly about two of them. Again, retail transactions sort of down to earth, and this one sort of feels simpler than all that formalism I was talking about before. Um, if you look, we've got products, we've got, again, my verbs, activities, tags. So I'm on a website, I want to tag my stuff. You know, my daughter's Erin, I want to tag her room on the website. Brands, because I care. Um, content types, I always have. That's kinds of things. And how they link together. So if you think about this, um, if I'm working at this retail place and I want to understand how people in my demographic shop and the kind of brands they use, I can look, they can look at Erin's room and see the kind of um, appliances that I've got in my house that sort of support that. And again, I'm sort of blasting through it here, but this is in a simple way. Um, another one I've done, and this was a search, and I just want to bring this up because it's sort of one versus many, started with a taxonomy, very sort of standard issue, and the taxonomy provides values for the facets. And I've got preferred terms, I've got my lead terms, I've got my synonyms, I've got my normal RTs, you know, relationship types. Um, I had buckets for unmapped terms and used a very standard issue, in fact, more than very standard issue, taxonomy management tool to create mappings, which I managed in my relationship types, and <coughs> created outputs that fed one search engine. And this is for, well, this was for IBM, I can share that. This is for a big company, right? So this was a while ago. In today's world, we want to build an ontology to do the same thing because IBM needs to access data from so many other different sources. And we have to make our search engine so much bigger and better and smarter because it's referring to the ontology. So in today's world, there's more than one uh, taxonomy owners. There are lots of people who contribute to my ontology. So I don't just feed it. I don't just build it out of my head like I did before, like I did with that retail one. I don't do that. People, they're standard taxonomy owners. They create and maintain their vocabularies, and they use a big data tool and an enterprise master data management tool, which has nothing to do with our kind of IA stuff. It's just a big data tool. Um, there are custom taxonomy owners, because we're also in a search engine, bringing together all the information from various applications that IBMers use, and they have taxonomies or vocabularies that are specific to them. And they also manage them wherever they want, either in their application or in the MDM master data management tool. So to manage all this, rather than just me, we have an ontology team. And the ontology team creates the data model, again, with much richer set of relationship types with those functions and constraints and using a formal approach. Formal approach. I used to be very, you know, fast and loose <laughs> and used whatever format I wanted, but in today's world you can't because you have to interchange data. They add relationships and attributes as they need them, more on the fly than I ever was. They use tools for content analysis, both to generate synonyms and to include entities, people, places, and things in the ontology, which is kind of awesome. I mean, a quick digression, when another of our clients who's in the news biz, it was, it was a big deal for us uh, years ago, like nine years ago, when we were able to include people in their taxonomy and we linked celebrities, for example, we linked sports figures, most notably, in the ontology with the teams they play for. And all of a sudden, everything becomes a whole lot more powerful. So I'm going to skip over my governance activities, um, quickly tell you to, if you need to create a, an ontology for big data, again, it's, it's like what we used to do in the world of taxonomy and thesauri, but it's slightly different. You always need to know what you're going to use it for, right? Customer sat is always a good example of why you might use lots and lots of data, why you might need an ontology to infer relationships that don't exist by themselves in the data. But you, your mileage might vary. You know, I know that you guys are 
in e-commerce and all sorts of things. Um, select an existing ontology as a model. I'm clearly a Yago fan. Um, customize and add new relationships based on the domain. It was very powerful when I could go people to their skills. For me, again, these entities was very, very powerful because I can tell a lot about you if I know the kind of skills that you say you have versus my analyzing the data to see the kind of skills that you exhibit in the stuff that you publish or in your web presence. Um, synonyms, again, go out to social media. Big data means the world is accessible to us because we're all so interconnected. You know, Twitter handles sometimes mean a lot. They're, they're verbs and hashtags. I love that. Hashtags are snarky little sentences that are very awesome to me as a taxonomist. You know, don't you, well, this is heresy, forgive me, but use, use the technology, you know, make the punishment fit the crime, as Seth Early and I used to say. Use the ontology and store the ontology where you want to get to it quickly. So a graph database for Neo4j would be a really awesome way to store an ontology. Um, write specs for IT, because you're always going to have to talk to IT, and always, always test. And since I see my time is very close to up, I wanted to get back to how this makes us happy. So I kind of asked Yago, and if you look at it, it's kind of cool. We have three meanings of life, which maybe is whatever that word was, individuation, ideation. Um, we have world peace, which makes me happy. And then Denmark, I don't know why, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> and uh, space colony, which makes my husband happy. So thanks a lot, you guys. <laughs> Let me know if you have any questions. I think we've got time for just a couple of questions. If anyone would like to step up to the microphone here or just uh, shout out your question and we'll repeat it into the microphone. It's perfectly understandable. Yeah. Yes. yes. We have a question right here. No. Oh, do I always build my ontologies thinking they're going to be used by inference engines? And the answer is, is no, because in my world, they're usually used for a very specific application, like a large search application, or like a website that's devoted to um, making hotel reservations, or a website that's devoted to e-commerce or selling retail. So I'm, so I'm, never, I'm never that abstract. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you.